Good afternoon, veteran entrepreneurs. This is Coach Bun with the Warrior Rising Podcast, Office Hours, Episode 2. Uh, during our last session, we had a talk about uh, both the benefits and challenges of starting your own business. Um, I had a nice little kind of 30-minute rant where I talked about both some of the upsides and downsides associated with veteran entrepreneurship or just entrepreneurship in general. Um, but today, um, you know, I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk a little bit about some of the top five things that I think are really valuable for veteran entrepreneurs. Um, I think there's a lot of lessons learned. I think in entrepreneurship, there's a lot of different skills, um, a lot of different tools, um, education, um, and just generalized tools of the trade that can really help you be successful. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the top five today that I have found to be very helpful, specifically in my journey. And then also, um, these are also different things that I've heard individuals that are captains in industry, um, popular veteran entrepreneurs, people that work in finance, um, and like, you know, just captains of industry that have had best practices um, that they've shared with the rest of the world. And so I'm going to kind of go down that top five list and we're going to get right into it. So starting first and foremost is public speaking or storytelling. Um, so there's an old interview with Warren Buffett. If you're not familiar with Warren Buffett, he's the guy that kind of like founded and leads Berkshire Hathaway, which is a financial investment organization that's pretty popular. And Warren Buffett's like one of the top five like richest people in the world. Really interesting thing. The guy like eats McDonald's breakfast every day and also drinks like a Coca-Cola classic every day, which I think is just like so interesting that he's like loaded and could just be like, you know, having deviled eggs with creme fraiche and like caviar and like probably be getting like an artisanal soda made by some guy in a Carhartt beanie with a tattoo of a dagger on his face for breakfast every morning. But instead, he's just like literally goes through the drive through of McDonald's. And no joke, not only does he go through the drive through of McDonald's, um, depending on what the market performance was like the day prior, he will, <laughs> he, will, he will actually be conservative in his order. So if like the NASDAQ or something or the S&P is down, he will like actually get a less expensive breakfast. Like just so we're all clear, you know, his breakfast, no matter what, costs like under $5. Um, is that the reason why he's rich? No, but his mindset is. So it's just something to think about. But in a really famous... Um, public interview, he was like at like NYU or something like that, telling a bunch of liberal college kids how they can go on in life to be successful. The majority of them are probably not going to take his advice, um, but I'm sure because of their affluent backgrounds, they're still doing pretty okay. But um, somebody asked, like, "Hey, what's the most valuable thing, or what's what's the one skill that you would you would um, you know tell young professionals, entrepreneurs, people that are that are working um, in business, finance, whatever the case may be, people that want to go off and be successful? What would you?" What's a skill that you would develop? And he said public speaking. Um, and I just couldn't agree more. The ability to clearly articulate yourself in a room full of people, whether you're pitching them an idea for a new consumer product good, asking for money, or just trying to captivate the attention of people who might be paying for your time is an absolutely invaluable skill. Moreover, I think storytelling is really important. And as a matter of fact, in the last couple interviews that I've been on, I, I do on occasion interview. I think for the most part now I get hired by my reputation alone, which is like kind of a cool spot to be in. Um, maybe not always though. I don't know, right? It's a double-edged sword. But um, my last interview, the last interview that I was on, the only one I've had in like the past two years, um, the, the CEO of the organization asked me, he's like, he's like, what's your superpower? And I was like, man, I tell great stories. And, you know, he kind of had me unpack that a little bit. And essentially, I, I told this man a story. And then later on down the road, um, of course, was hired and, and commanded a very high salary um, and went on to, to do okay in the organization. Um, so I, I think that ability to tell stories particularly is very important when you're a veteran entrepreneur. I've had the opportunity to be pitched by individuals a couple times a week, pretty much for like the past year. I consistently get opportunities for people to tell me, about something that they're selling, a new business idea that they've created, um, or in some cases, they're just sharing with me an idea that they might have for a business over the horizon. And nine times out of 10, if that person is great at telling a story, if I feel somehow emotionally involved because uh, of the empathy I feel based on their enthusiasm and their charisma and their belief in this thing, um, it becomes somehow more tangible to me, right? Um, so I, I just can't stress enough that the ability to be a good public speaker 
is just such a tremendously valuable tool, not just in business, but in entrepreneurship. Um, and then once again, storytelling is great. And like back in the day, it, when I used to like go on dates, I'm married now, I'm happily married, I've been with the same person for, for years, lived with the same person for years, my wife, Samantha, by the way. Um, but uh, back when I was like still out there on the market, I would always show up to a date ready with some compelling story that I was going to tell. Um, and I would use that story, one, to kind of like fill dead space, but two, um, uh, you know, I would always do my best to make the other person laugh and I always thought it was just like a great way to kind of break the ice, so to speak, was if, if I had a story on deck just in case we like ran out of things to talk about. And I had like a Rolodex of about four or five that were pretty captivating. Usually it was about run-ins with the law or some shit I did in war or something like that. But um, I think it's absolutely invaluable um, to, to be a good storyteller and to be a good public speaker. And like anything, right? I, I tell this to people all the time. And as a matter of fact, anytime I'm in a public speaking engagement, I always kind of look out at the crowd. And before I get started, I tell everybody, I say, you know, listen, I, just fun fact for the crowd, public speaking is the number two fear of all Americans. And then I give this big present, uh, pregnant pause. And then I go, number one is snakes. Uh, for whatever reason, everybody just laughs their ass off whenever I tell that joke. It delivers really well, I guess. Um, but it always kills. So if you ever want to kind of open up a public uh, speaking event or engagement with that joke, feel free. I want to nickel every time you do it. Um, look at this entrepreneurship in action. Um, but it's true. Public public speaking is the number two fear of all Americans. There's nothing more terrifying than getting up in front of a room full of people and bombing or having them yawn or even worse, getting up and walking out or God forbid, those individuals in the crowd want to start engaging you in arguments or something like that. So, uh, but that with that in mind, the fact that it is this thing that is difficult, um, tangibly difficult, right? And, the, and because it is something that Americans are afraid of, just like anything else, you can improve it with practice. Um, in the military, I had an opportunity to teach courses. Um, I was frequently pressure tested um, throughout my military career with opportunities to publicly speak. Most specifically, when I was just a young man in my early 20s, not even 25 years old, in the Special Forces Qualification course, um, everybody is expected uh, not only to be able to to execute small unit tactics, but they must also be able to plan those same small unit tactics. Or said another way, not only did you need to be able to execute large scale acts of violence, you needed to be able to plan large scale acts of violence. And part of that was being able to succinctly and concisely brief whatever your plan was to a group of people, or more importantly, the, the group of people that you intended to go out there and do this violent thing with you. Um, so the way that I learned how to publicly speak was by like talking to people about how I like intended to initiate an ambush with a machine gun and then like follow on by killing every single person that was on the objective. So obviously stakes very high for my initial uh, foray into public speaking, but it was a great opportunity for me to take this skill and develop it right where the pressure was high, um, where people were asking questions that, that might eventually, you know, determine whether we would live or die. And I had this tremendous opportunity to develop um, this skill to publicly speak. And that's kind of where I first encountered it was in the military. I continued to have that opportunity um, as I was involved in intelligence and different operations like that, or, or um, started working more in intelligence in the special forces. And of course, later on, um, as an infantry officer was consistently responsible to provide all manner of uh, of of uh, public presentations that covered everything from logistics, um, of course, actual tactical operations, um, to like whatever we might be doing in the motor pool next week. Um, and when I was in those environments and when I had those opportunities to publicly speak or brief these things, once again, the pressure seemed high, right? Uh, individuals would ask you questions. They would have the expectation that you knew the information inherently, that not only were you just saying these things, but you also actually knew what you were talking about. So it was such an excellent opportunity. But like, what if you as an individual didn't have an opportunity to like be in the special forces and talk about killing people in a public way, or you weren't an infantry officer with the same types of expectations? Like, listen, no big deal. I think the best way to do that is to join a Toastmasters group. They're all over the place. And it's a fantastic opportunity, not just to learn how to speak publicly and storytell, but also it's a great opportunity to network. And listen, public speaking, storytelling, networking, my God, these are invaluable skills for veteran entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs alike. So if you get the opportunity to go out there and hone that skill, I think it's the number one way to excel as an entrepreneur is public speaking. 
Number two, sales. My God, listen, a lot of people, listen, I hate selling stuff. I mean, I absolutely hate it. Um, anytime I'm trying to sell a product or a service, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm knocking on somebody's door trying to sell them a used vacuum cleaner. It feels like kind of gross and icky sometimes, but listen, the fact of the matter is, is you might have this beautiful idea, this thing that solves a pain point out there in the market, and the only way for you to kind of bring this value to, to, the, to the masses, right, um, to the consumer, to the people that it's gonna matter to, is gonna be your ability to clearly articulate and sell this thing to these people, right? There's all manner of skills that are necessary in, in terms of uh, being a business person or owning your own business, whether it's managing logistics, being organized, um, you know, ha not being uh, averse to failing, um, being risk aggressive, like, you know, being open to Chris's, all these things are so important. But I think one of the skills that is most important is sales, because at the end of the day, this, this ability to go out there and sell this thing that you have, whether it's an idea, a service, or a physical good, is absolutely integral to you having the opportunity to participate in the economy in a fitful way. It's like, what the hell are we doing? So listen, it, however you got to go about sales or whatever, I, whenever I tell people like, hey, listen, I'm a brand new uh, business owner. It's like, I have the, this product, I have this thing. You know, what, what should I be doing? I'm like, listen, you should be right at the tip of the spear doing your best to sell it with everybody else inside your organization. And, and truth be told, when you first start, you will probably be the only person that's kind of out there selling this thing. Um, but later on down the road, you will, of course, you know, recruit or hire people that will also, you know, have probably a tremendous amount of experience, both in business development and sales, um, have like a storied background, and they've been to like Lean Six Sigma or some Grant Cardone crazy course where they've learned to like, you know, you know sell, you know, anything to anybody. Um, but the fact of the matter is that it is an absolutely important skill. And I think of all the verticals that exist inside organizations, both small and large, um, the, the sales vertical at the end of the day is always the most important because they're opening up new doors, bringing revenue into the organization and making sure the lifeblood, which is capital, continues to flow through said organization so that you can continue to survive and thrive. So sales is absolutely so important. So it's a big deal. And if you don't have the ability to sell, um, truth be told, it's you, you probably don't need to be involved in entrepreneurship. I think there's probably a place in the world for some like weird little tech guy who's just like a dev dude who just like spends a lot of time doing code and you can potentially walk into an office because you, you're touched by God and have this idea that's absolutely fantastic and, and people recognize it because they have the acumen or you've somehow established yourself in that way. But I honestly think that's about one in a million. And in most cases, regardless of what it is that you have, whether people either believe that it's valuable or, you know, potentially ha have some hesitation or need to be convinced. If you don't have the ability to walk into a room and sell that thing, um, chances are that you're going to fail in business. Um, so sales, absolutely important. Um, I kind of touched on this when I was talking about some of the other tools and skills and, and things that are really valuable. Um, but I really feel deeply personal about number three. Um, and that's the, the, you know, you need to have grit. You need to be gritty. Um, and it's funny because, you know, I was thinking about the topics that I was going to talk about today, a couple days ago, and I actually like typed it into chat GPT. I was like, man, what is a word, um, that means that you're, you're not afraid to fail. Like literally just like type that prompt prompt into chat GPT. And it was interesting because a computer spit out an answer to me that I'm now like regurgitating out to the rest of the world. And by the world, I mean like the 40 or 50 people that are watching this goddamn thing. Um, so that's kind of weird, right? I'm like giving you robot information. Here we are. We're in the future. Um, but I, I thought it would, but I saw the word grit and I saw the word gritty and I was like, that's very true. And I've, I've listened to a lot of speeches, podcasts, Freakonomics has a couple of great ones on grit, um, where they talk about grit and how it's this like thing that's very difficult to define. Um, it's this thing that's very difficult to develop um, and it's like just kind of this nebulous concept, but you know, not being afraid to fail is this really fantastic thing. Cause I think in a lot of ways, people avoid risky situations and avoid taking chances that might have significant upside based purely on the fact that they're afraid to fail. And in some cases, the failure might not actually have significant consequences. Like 
it might not lead to financial ruin. Like, in, you know, in some cases, you know, failing can lead to things like, you know, financial ruin, like arrest, you know, divorce, like it can, it can lead to the collapse of your personal and professional life, all this kind of stuff. But I think in most cases, um, the worst part of failing, uh, as far as we're all concerned, is we just don't want to be seen failing, right? I think, you know, shame uh, or the shame associated with failing in front of others is such a powerful motivator. And I think it's a, a great motivator at times because it, it provides us with this real urgency to succeed. But that being said, we can't be so afraid of this idea of failing in front of others that uh, it, it, it leaves us paralyzed to the point where we can't, where we don't want to take this risk to go do this amazing thing. Um, and I think one of the most important things for, for new entrepreneurs is having the grit to fail in front of others and having that grittiness to not just fall down, but to, to get back up. Because the fact of the matter is, is if you start your own business, you are going to fail constantly. And those failures are going to be both public and spectacular in nature, right? In some cases, it'll land on the internet. There might be a news article about how your organization has lost funding. You know, your board of directors might send out a public later uh, letter, excuse me, uh, about how you're a turd or something like this. So, you know, the, the stakes can get pretty high um, and it's difficult to fail in front of others. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, I think, you know, when you're an employee somewhere, and you fail, it somehow feels less intense or less acute because it's almost like that failure, the feeling of that failure gets dissipated into the identity of that organization, whatever it is. Like if I lose an account and I'm working for Progressive Auto Insurance, it's like, dude, whatever, man. That's just some joker who had car insurance with Progressive. See you later, alligator. Go have fun with the the Allstate guy with that beautiful deep voice of his or whatever, right? Um, but it's like, but like when the stakes are so much lower, right, you know, and you're just like working at a gym or something like that and you lose a member that you've had for six months, it feels deeply personal and it feels like this like significant failure on your part as if you have done something wrong. <clears throat> and the fact of the matter is you might have, you might have done something wrong. The reason that person might be quitting your gym, the reason that person might never buy your product again, might never visit your restaurant again, might never ask for your services again, is because you've somehow failed them. Um, but you got to be okay with that. And you got to understand that even though you, you might fail, you might fall down, if you have the ability to, to stand yourself back up, dust off, um, and get back in the ring for a little bit more, you're going to be a good entrepreneur. It's going to give you an opportunity to succeed and truth be told, if, if you are not afraid of failure and it's difficult to, to embarrass you, my God, it makes you nearly invincible. It's like having goddamn superpowers. Um, I tell people all the time, I used to have friends that would try and uh, sign me up for karaoke as a joke. And I don't care what the song is. I don't care what's happening. I will stand up there and I'll do my best to sing whatever song it is. I think the last time I got hit up for that, it was Skater Boy by Avril Lavigne. It was as I was on my way back from Afghanistan and it was in front of like 1,200 soldiers from across different units in the military and my platoon did it to try and embarrass me and I got up there and sang Skater Boy from start to finish to a room full of like over a 1,000 people in uniform, killers, people that had killed people and I had no problems whatsoever. Dude, it was amazing. When it was all said and done, people were like pat me on the back and treat me like I was a famous person. It was freaking incredible. All based on the fact that I just didn't feel embarrassed at the time. I was just, I embraced it and I was afraid to go up there and sound like hell. Decent song, not for me really though. Um, so, you know, point number four, right? You gotta be open to criticism, open to criticism. Um, so you need to be willing to accept critical feedback. Um, let's talk about that. This one's personal for me too because um, I, I really don't take feedback very well, right? A good example is... Uh, Amongst all my different entrepreneurial pursuits, um, the thing that I've been doing the longest as an entrepreneur is I own a CrossFit gym in Tampa, Florida called Cigar City CrossFit. It's my baby. I love it. Um, I've spent eight years um, running that gym. Um, and during that time, I've had a lot of opportunities, once again, like I said, to fail in front of others, get good at sales, opportunities to public speak for group workouts. I mean, by nature, whenever you're at a CrossFit gym and, and talking to a group of people, it is, in fact, public speaking. Um, but during that time, I've had plenty of opportunities where members have, you know, provided me with critical feedback based on the services that I was offering. And I'm going to tell you, it, it always, 
feels personal. It always feels personal, right? And I, I'm, it's difficult for me to take feedback well. And the reason being is because when you're so involved in a business and you're so intimately involved in the day-to-day operations, you start to feel like you personally have a real edge or you're, you know it so intimately that it would be very difficult for anybody else um, to kind of give you an opinion that maybe you haven't already thought of or maybe that you, you know, or one that you think might be better than the one that you currently hold. And the fact of the matter is we all have personal biases, right? And we have to be able to look past those biases and take sound counsel and advice from people close to you, or in some cases it might be customers, in some cases it might be strategic partners, whatever the case may be, if somebody has the, and I'm going to tell you, delivering critical feedback is scary. It's not fun. Um, Whenever I have to tell somebody that they've done a bad job, I literally have to usually take about 24 hours just to think about how I might deliver that news because it it fills me with so much anxiety that I know that I'm going to tell somebody that they've done a bad job. Um, because you can usually see the look on their face, right? Like the color drains from their face. You can see, you know, the, the, the feeling of failure wash over them in some cases or in other cases, just like they're furious, you know, cause they like don't like the information or are made uncomfortable by the information that you're delivering to them. But like the fact of the matter is if somebody has the courage to deliver you critical feedback, my brothers and sisters in Christ, it is probably pretty fucking important. You know what I mean? And it might do you well to sit there, open your ears, listen to what they have to say, right? And really have a big, long think on it. Because that critical feedback might be the thing that's going to save your life. A good example, and this is probably not going to resonate with a lot of people, except some jokers out there wearing tights with a headband on and some like midriff cutoff shirt. I'm talking about CrossFit athletes. But a long time ago, in my CrossFit gym, Um, We were vehemently against the idea of open gym or people being able to work out on their own. We wanted to participate in the group fitness classes because we believe that's where the magic was. It was like, why wouldn't you want to be part of this great thing? Be coached by people that have incredible acumen and training. They're going to keep you safe. You know, our programming is deliberate and planned. It's like, you got to get in on this. But in reality, you know, what we didn't take into consideration is that every day our customers might not be coming in there to just get a group fitness workout from from me or one of my coaches. Moreover, something that's in the workout, right, might be something that's like they either dread terribly, maybe it causes them physical pain, maybe they feel embarrassed doing the movement. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what's going through their head, but limiting that person's ability to come inside the gym and pursue fitness on their own in hindsight is crazy. But I felt so... I felt so passionate about it and I had such a significant bias against individuals seeking out the ability to to pursue open gym that I was just super against it. And people would like draft the idea by me. They're like, I don't know, man. I think maybe you should just like, why would you limit a person's ability to come in here and pursue fitness? Why not just let them do what they want? And I, you know, I'd be like, shut up, you're stupid. You don't know what you're talking about, you know? Um, you know, or just like immediately dismiss it. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is as I had an opportunity to think about it, not just in terms of from the athlete's perspective, but from like a legitimate economic perspective. Listen, I only got five classes a day. You're trying to tell me I only have an opportunity to make money for five hours during the day? That's bananas. Um, And in reality, I was like, the gym was open, you know, in some cases about 14 hours a day. So instead of me limiting individuals' ability to pursue fitness, um, why don't I, why don't I, I open up my aperture and give people the opportunity to walk through the door at any point in time, whether or not there's a class going on and pursue fitness, whether it's on their own or in a group class led by a coach. And the fact of the matter is, is since I've adopted the policy of being able to have people do open gym, um, I think we've been better for it. But the fact of the matter is, is in order for me to be open to that criticism, I really had to take a step out of my own biases and try and look at it from the perspective of customers, strategic partners, people that were close to the business and had a good idea. Um, If you're a business owner and you're looking for a customer to take advice from, um, I always have these kind of criteria that makes up a good customer. And this is just like kind of a perfunctory example. Don't live and die by this. But good customers, these tier one customers, are people that spend a ton ton of money inside your organization, Um, people that have been a loyal customer for a long period of time, and somebody that you like, right? Somebody that you like. Um, the third one is, is largely qualitative, liking somebody. It's like, how do, you, how do you check that block? 
it's hard to say. I mean, if you're into mustaches, smoke meats, and World War II, chances are we're going to get along okay. Um, but like, it might not always be the case too. But uh, the other two are very much quantifiable. Like, if you have somebody that's that's been loyal to your business, has been returning to purchase things from you, or has been a client or a customer for five plus years and has spent a ton of money with you, like you should be asking that person if there's anything that you can do to improve your services um, or your product, because chances are they've got an opinion about it, um, and chances are that it's going to be valuable. Um, so keep in mind who those tier one uh, customers are, and don't only be uh, open to the idea of receiving critical feedback, uh, you should actually go out to the world and try and seek it out once you feel comfortable enough to do so, and I think it'll be a powerful tool um, to help improve your services and become a better entrepreneur. Last one. This last one's one of my favorites. Um, I struggled with it personally back in the day, so I always love to bring it up. But damn it, man. Um, you should learn how to use Microsoft Excel. LinkedIn has a free course where you can just learn Microsoft Excel. It's self-paced. It only takes a few weeks to do real simple stuff. It'll teach you how to do pivot tables and some of these simple tools um, that can systemize work. Listen, the entire financial system uh, in the United States of America, which is the largest economy on the face of the planet, is propped up by Excel. Like if all of a sudden some, if you really wanted to end civilization, you just like sneak in in the middle of the night and like somehow pluck out Microsoft Excel from all the financial institutions, dude, it would be bedlam like the next day. Like we would be in the, it'd be like the dark ages, man. Um, it, it would be like removing fire from, from, uh, from the caveman, you know what I'm saying? It would set us back a century. It'd be bananas. Um, Microsoft Excel is like one of the most powerful organizational tools that's ever been created. And if you know how to use it really well in business, people, it's like knowing fucking magic. Um, no joke. It's like your people will think you're a sorcerer. Um, you're out here doing the dark arts with uh, some Excel formulas and stuff. People that use Excel are valuable. And if you're able to show that you can use Excel proficiently, um, you are a formidable individual in almost any workspace. Now, I joke about Excel, but in reality, I want to take this example of Microsoft Excel, which is something that would exist as part of a tech stack, um, and kind of expound upon that. Um, being able to understand relevant, um, essentially, uh, tools and systems that can be implemented into your organization and um, these tools and systems, typically speaking, are technology-based. Not always. Some of them might be manual in nature. Maybe it's a recurring meeting on Mondays. Um, maybe you have like a work-from-home policy that you institute in such a way to provide relief to your workers who have long commutes. Because like maybe you're in New York, and the majority of your people like live in Brooklyn, eating artisanal popcorn or whatever, or having to drive in from New Jersey or something like that. And like given this day and age, you're just like, hey, listen, guys, Fridays are optional. You know what I'm saying? And now all of a sudden productivity Monday through Thursday goes through the absolute roof. Because, you know, in my opinion, I don't, even, I don't actually think anybody even does shit on Friday. I do my best not to. Last couple Fridays, though, I've been getting hammered, though. Not hammered, like I haven't been going out and consuming too much alcohol irresponsibly. Like I've been just like having to do a lot of work. Um, to be clear, for legal reasons, I want to make sure I, I clear that up. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, like, I, you know, it could be something as simple as that. Or it could be, you know developing or, and implementing project management software that's going to provide speed of implementation for your staff and for your organization. And it could be something as simple as using Slack so that individuals are no longer texting each other in order to get things done. Because by the way, your cell phone is for personal use, not for the business, not unless they're paying for it. And uh, you know, if they are paying for it, then like there's still an argument to be made that I don't want to be sent a text message at 8 p.m. about shit from work. Um, you know, or, or, you know, speed of implementation, it can also be a, an opportunity to provide an additional uh, platform by which individuals can quickly communicate with one another. You can compartmentalize certain communications that are specific to verticals or committees, all kinds of things. Um, it could be something as simple as Slack, like I just mentioned, that can, you know, alleviate problems like people receiving work texts on their personal phones. Um, or lag time in terms of responses, or it could be very complex uh, uh, systems management tools or project management tools like Salesforce. And Salesforce is basically the carbon molecule uh, for systems management tools. It does a little bit of everything. I was just in San Francisco about a week and a half ago, and I was on the Salesforce campus. 
um, and it looked like it was from the actual fucking future. They got they got more money than Davy Crockett. I'm pretty sure they just acquired Slack, which was a public company for more than four billion dollars. And they were like, "Yeah, no problem. I'm actually going to just like purchase all the open shares on the market so that I can control it." And now it belongs to us, Salesforce, a private company. Um, they literally their campus in San Francisco looks like the future. I was like, this is what the future could be like. It was like a sky bridge with like air plants and like succulents and shit hanging off of it. There was people just like walking around eating craft tacos and frescas and stuff. It was bananas. Um, well, I don't know what Salesforce is doing other than creating software that for me personally is painful. Uh, but based on what their campus is looking like, it seems like they have, uh, uh, you know, a product that a lot of people want. But long story short is that building out an effective tech stack for your organization, whatever that may be, can be really important in reaching an economy of skill for both small, medium, and large staffs. And it's whether you have 10 people, 10,000 people, um, developing uh, a tech stack that makes sense for you and your organization um, is absolutely integral to reaching an economy of scale um, and producing uh, uh, speed of implementation and efficacy in your work. And, and one of the things that I love and one of the things I tell people is like another thing when people ask me what's my superpower is I always tell them speed of implementation. I work quickly. I respond almost immediately to emails. When somebody provides me with a task, I try and complete it as soon as humanly possible. And the reason being is I, I think if if you are the first one there, right? If you're the first, like you ever think of like the Boston Marathon or one of these large races, being the guy that's at the back of the race because you showed up late and then having to fight your way through a crowd of like 5,000 people, you know, all smelling like Ben Gay and Vaseline and all this other kind of crazy crap with all their little power gels and all this stuff seems like a nightmare to me. I'd much rather be at the very front with that Ethiopian dude who's getting ready to sprint for his life, man. So, you know, it's like you got to think to yourself, where do you want to be? You want to be at the back of the pack at the start of the race or do you want to be at the front? Effective technology and systems is a great way to get you right at the front of the race so you don't have to fight through that crowd. Um, so those are my top five. Just a recap, guys. Public speaking. Love it, right? Public speaking and storytelling is an absolutely invaluable tool. Warren Buffett seems to think it's valuable, and you know he's got more money than Jesus, so what's up? Sales. Being the ability, or excuse me, developing the ability to sell is really important. It doesn't matter if you're the CEO or you're somebody that's working in customer experience. Um, if you develop a, a, a healthy appetite for sales, you'll quickly find yourself in the business of making money. Um, being gritty, not being afraid to fail. Absolutely. I, I love it, right? If, if you can find yourself into a place where you're not afraid to fail, you can't be embarrassed. Like I said, it's, it's a 100% a superpower and it's something that will serve you well in entrepreneurship as, you know, unfortunately that, that, that path is, is fraught with potholes. Um, but you know, having that grit is going to help you navigate it a little bit more effectively. Of course, being open to criticism, not just open to it, or uh, excuse me, being open to criticism, um, but not just being open to it, but seeking it out when, when needed so that you can improve your business is, is a fantastic way to excel as an entrepreneur. And then finally, God damn, man, you just need to learn how to use Microsoft Excel. It's absolutely invaluable. But of course, outside of Excel, making sure um, that you're seeking out the right uh, systems that you can install inside your organization, once again, to, to help with speed of implementation and efficacy um, are uh, is an absolutely fantastic approach to excelling in business. No pun intended. So I really want to appreciate everybody for tuning in today. Um, you can catch us bi-weekly on Tuesdays for office hours. So once a month, you'll have an opportunity to just kind of hear me riff about lessons I've learned in business. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like me to answer, you can always reach out to programs at warriorizing.org. If you're interested in participating or donating to Warrior Rising, you can head over to warriorizing.org. That is our website. That gives you an opportunity to sign up for our programs. And then, of course, if you'd like to donate to help support the next great American veteran-owned business, you can head over to our website. And there's multiple opportunities to both support and donate to the organization. Once again, Warrior Rising is the premier veteran transition organization committed to helping veteran entrepreneurs excel in business. I can't thank you enough for joining me today. Tune in next week so that you can hear our next podcast featuring our executive director. Excuse me. Tune in next week excuse me, tune in the week after next so you can join us to learn more about our executive director, Jason Van Camp. Thanks again for joining me. Talk soon.